Good afternoon. So I'd like to ask you for a few minutes to imagine that you are a bar-tailed godwit, a small, medium-sized wading bird. You are hatched at the beginning of the summer in Alaska, but summer is coming to an end. It's starting to get chilly. Winter is coming and you feel the urge to fly south. And your destination is New Zealand, a mere 11,000 kilometers away across the Pacific Ocean. But that's okay because you can fly nonstop, day and night, flapping the whole time at an average speed of 60 kilometers an hour. So all being well, it'll only take you eight days. Now, if that wasn't enough, you also have to navigate while you're at it. It's a matter of life and death that you don't lose your way over the ocean. Well, you don't have GPS. You can't use satellite nav navigation, sat nav. But what you can do is to use the sun and the stars to get a sense of direction. You have a keen sense of smell, which may help you home in on your target when you get close to it. And you can recognize landmarks if you've been that way before but there are not too many of those across the ocean. But what you really need, in addition to all of these, is a magnetic compass. You need to be able to detect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field, albeit perhaps not with the top technology shown on this slide. What I want to talk to you about is the possibility that birds use a chemical mechanism to sense the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. So not sat-nav, but maybe chem nav, chemical navigation. And it's not just the godwits. Northern wheat ears, a global population of about 3 million, they weigh about 25 grams each, so about the weight of a packet of crisps. And some of them fly staggering distances from eastern Canada to western Africa, or from Alaska going the other way to East Africa enormous distances and back again year after year if they're lucky and you can see why a magnetic compass might be useful to avoid getting lost on these extraordinary journeys even the european robin the birds that we see all the year round in our gardens many of them do migrate not many in the uk so in the dark green areas here these are where most of the robins are residential all year round, but in the light green areas in Scandinavia and northeastern Europe, many of the robins fly every year to the south of Europe or to the north of Africa and back again. And it seems that they all have this ability to detect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field and use it to help them navigate. And it's not just birds, many animal species seem to have some kind of magnetic sense as well. Some of them are shown here. But far more is known about the birds than any other animal. And for that reason, I'll focus on birds. So how does this magnetic compass sense work? And could it really be a chemical mechanism? Well, first of all, <coughs> how do we know that birds have a magnetic compass? So it's been suspected that they do since the 19th century, but only really known since the 1960s. And I want to describe to you briefly the experiments that are done these days to test the magnetic orientation capabilities of small migratory songbirds. So this is a testing facility on the campus of the University of Oldenburg in Northern Germany. My collaborator, Henrik Mauritsen and I uh, had a research grant a few years ago that paid for this completely non-magnetic building. There is nothing in the construction of this house which is magnetic. And inside there are four chambers, the inside of which look something like this. So each chamber is very carefully screened from electromagnetic interference from the outside world. And inside each chamber you see structures like this. It looks like a bird cage but it's not. In fact, it's magnetic field coils. 
So four coils in each of the three dimensions. And by very carefully controlling the currents that flow through the copper wires of those coils, you could control the magnetic field in the middle of this two meter cube. And in the middle, there's a table sitting on which are nine of these so-called Emlen funnels. So these are orientation cages. You put one bird in each funnel with a translucent lid. So light can get in, but the birds can't escape and they can't see out. The funnels themselves, as you can see, are cylindrically symmetric. So the birds get no directional information at all inside the funnels, except from the magnetic field supplied by the coils that surround them. And during the migratory season, the birds, when you put them in these funnels at dusk, which is when they're preparing to fly through the night, most of these birds are nocturnal migrants. They exhibit a behavior known as migratory restlessness, which was first observed in caged songbirds in the 18th century. So in the spring and the autumn, when the wild birds are motivated to fly, north or south, depending on the season, the birds in captivity start putting on weight, as it were, to prepare for the journey and start getting restless in the evening. And it's well established that the direction in which the birds jump in these cages in an attempt to escape is the direction in which they would fly if you release them. So to show that they have a magnetic compass, all you need to do is to test them in a rotated magnetic field and if they jump in a different direction, then you know that they're using a magnetic compass. And that's how it was first demonstrated in the 1960s, that initially European robins have a magnetic compass. And the way the experiments are done, it's really quite low tech, but it works, everyone does it this way, is that the inside of the funnels are lined with scratch sensitive paper. So when the bird has been in there for an hour, attempting to escape, at the end of the hour, you take the paper out and look at the scratches. And from the cartoon you can see here, this bird evidently wanted to go to the northeast. So that's how we know that they have a magnetic compass. And how does it work? Well, that's the big question. First of all, I want to tell you how it doesn't work. So pretty much the only organism whose magnetic responses we understand is this bacterium. It's called magnetotactic bacterium. These were discovered only in the 1960s and 1970s. The scale here is one micron. So these things are a few millionths of a meter long. Uh, this is false color image from an electron microscope. And you can see that within the body of this animal, there are black blobs, each of which is a crystal of magnetic iron oxide. And these crystals are not things that the animal has eaten. It's genetically programmed to make them. And the crystals all line up to form what is in effect a compass needle inside the body of the bacterium. So why, you might ask, does a bacterium need to sense the Earth's magnetic field? Well, they live in shallow pools of water. And if they get too near the surface, then the high oxygen content will kill them. So they need to know up from down. They're too light to use gravity, so they've evolved to use the Earth's magnetic field. And just to show you that this is right, I'm going to show you a quick video. So what you see here is the edge of a droplet of water on a microscope stage. And these little black blobs here, each of these is one of the bacteria. And what you'll see when I start the video going is that the bacteria swim around and at various stages they move to different sides of the water droplet because someone is waving a magnet around. So there they're all congregating on the left hand side. Now the magnet is moved over to the right and they're all swimming towards me and sooner or later they'll all come back to the edge of the water droplet again. Okay, but that's not the way the birds do it. Difficult to imagine that the birds would have a whopping great compass needle inside their bodies that would 
somehow align them passively in the Earth's magnetic field. No, they have a genuine compass sense. So, and it's a rather strange one. If you test the birds in the northern hemisphere in the spring, when they're motivated to fly to the north uh, towards their breeding grounds, then they experience the Earth's magnetic field in the form of this arrow. So it points down and towards the north. And if then in the Emlyn Funnel experiment, you manipulate that field and you reverse the direction of the horizontal component so that it now points south, but still down. And under those conditions, the birds try to go in the opposite direction. And of course, that's not a surprise. If they had a regular compass needle, magnetized compass needle, it too would point south under those circumstances. More surprisingly though, if instead you invert the vertical component of the field so that now it points to the north and up, the birds still go in the wrong direction. Even though you would think the vertical component wouldn't have any directional information that would be useful to the bird. And it's only when you invert both components, so the field now points in exactly the opposite direction, only then do they go in the right direction. So it's not like a compass needle. It's what's known as an axial or inclination compass. And it's also light dependent. If you test the birds under blue and possibly green light, then they can use their magnetic compass in the Emlyn funnels perfectly well. If you use yellow or red light or total darkness, they jump in random directions. They can't use their compass. So it's light dependent. So neither of those properties would seem to be consistent with particles of magnetic iron oxide. So that at least means that the birds don't have to worry about this kind of thing happening. So this led to the idea that it might be a chemical mechanism. So what you need in principle for a chemical compass is a chemical reaction of this form. So reactants that can be converted reversibly into some chemical intermediate, which can then either revert to the reactants or go on to form the products. And to form a compass, what you need is that the probability that the intermediate goes one way or the other depends on the local magnetic field and in particular its direction. And then all the animal would need to do would be to detect the change in the yield of the reaction product as it looked around itself. And that would give it some information about the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, so that's the principle. But when you start to think about that, it looks like a ridiculous suggestion. And the reason is that the energy of interaction of the Earth's magnetic field, which after all is about a thousand times weaker than a small fridge magnet close up, the energy of interaction of the Earth's magnetic field with biological tissue is absolutely tiny, about a million times too small, surely, to affect a chemical reaction. Nevertheless, there is a form of chemical reactions that are sensitive to these very weak magnetic interactions. And a simple analogy is helpful to try and understand why that might be. So if you imagine that a chemical reaction is analogous to tipping over a heavy stone block, clearly that requires a certain amount of energy to raise the center of gravity of the block to get to this intermediate state in the middle. And so imagining that a chemical reaction could be affected by the Earth's magnetic field is like imagining a fly bumping into the side of the reactant block would actually affect the rate at which it tips over. It's just simply not going to happen. The amount of energy is far too small. However, if you look at this in a slightly different way, suppose you've already put the energy in to get the block poised in this intermediate state in the middle. So a non-equilibrium state for sure, um, with the block poised on its edge, teetering, it could easily fall forward or backwards. And now the fly landing on one side could make all the difference to whether it goes forward to products or backwards to reactants. So the message from this is that tiny amounts of energy, if applied to the right non-equilibrium states, 
can have profound effects. And this is what is known as the radical pair mechanism. And as this symbol in the bottom left is supposed to indicate, it's a quantum mechanical mechanism, hence the quantum robin in the title of this talk. Okay, so what is this mechanism? And I should say it's a real mechanism. It's been known since the 1970s that reactions of radical pairs are sensitive to extraordinarily weak magnetic interactions. Okay, so you probably know what free radicals are. If you've done chemistry, here are some examples. So if you take the simplest possible molecule, hydrogen, and break it in half to form a pair of hydrogen atoms, what you've done is to produce a pair of free radicals. So radicals are molecules that have an odd number of electrons. The hydrogen molecule has two. If you break it apart so that one electron ends up on each of the fragments, then you have formed a pair of hydrogen radicals or hydrogen atoms, and similarly hydrogen chloride. Or if you start with ethane and break the carbon-carbon bond, which is also held together by two electrons, you form a pair of methyl radicals. So the dots here on the right-hand side of the equations, these are supposed to indicate the odd electron. But you don't have to break a chemical bond to form a pair of radicals. You can take two molecules A and B, both of which have even numbers of electrons, and take an electron out of A and give it to B. Then you will have formed a pair of radicals again. Now A and B each have an odd number of electrons. So very often radicals are formed in pairs by reactions of this sort. And the crucial thing is that electrons have a property known as spin. This is a fundamental quantum mechanical property. Its real name is spin angular momentum. And particles like the electron that have spin also have magnetic moments. That is, the electron is magnetic. And that means that free radicals are magnetic. So the molecules that contain an even number of electrons the electrons all occur in pairs and their magnetic moments cancel one another. But if you have an odd number of electrons, then of course there must be at least one electron left over, which can't pair with anything, meaning that the radicals are magnetic. So let's have a simple chemical reaction and see how it might be sensitive to magnetic fields. Let's stick with a pair of methyl radicals, so very high energy chemical intermediates, highly reactive. Let's suppose we produce them somehow or other in liquid solution and then ask what happens next. Well, as soon as they bump into one another, you would think they would simply recombine to form ethane. Ethane is much more stable than a pair of methyl radicals. It's a thermodynamically very favorable reaction. And you would think it would happen every single time a pair of methyl radicals bump into one another. But it doesn't because of spin. So the chemical bond you form in the ethane between the two carbon atoms must be composed of two electrons and they must have opposite spins according to the Pauli principle. Spins here indicated by these little red arrows. And this chemical reaction conserves spin, which means that the two methyl radicals must have opposite spins, one up, one down, if they are able to combine to form ethane. But of course, they don't have to collide with opposite spins. They might have the same spin, both up, instead of one up, one down. And quantum mechanics tells you that they can only be one or the other, that is, parallel or anti-parallel electrons, one on each radical. Now, if they collide with parallel spins, as on the right-hand side here, they can't form ethane because that would not conserve spin. Ethane has to have the two electrons anti-parallel. And so that collision would have to do something else. And probably the methyl radicals will just extract an atom or a group of atoms from the solvent to form different products here, methyl X. 
And the jargon is that if they have anti-parallel spins, they're known as a singlet radical pair. If they have parallel spins, they're known as a triplet radical pair. Okay, so how would you influence the yields of the two reaction products, the ethane and the methyl X? Well, you'd need to interconvert singlet and triplet radical pairs. And the way to do that is to use a magnetic field. So just like a magnetized compass needle, if you wave a magnet near it, the compass needle will change its direction. In order to convert singlet into triplet, you just need to flip over one of the electron spins to make them parallel instead of anti-parallel. And you can do that with a magnetic field. So these reactions are sensitive to magnetic fields. If, for example, by applying a field or changing its direction, you make it more likely that you have a triplet radical pair, then you'll get a larger yield of this methyl X product. And you require only a tiny amount of energy to do this into conversion. And so very weak magnetic interactions will do the job. And this is the so-called radical pair mechanism. And it is a real mechanism. There are now hundreds of examples of laboratory studies of organic radical pair reactions that show magnetic field effects. So the big question is, does it happen inside a bird's body? And could it be the basis of a magnetic compass? And in fact, it's not an equilibrium, as I've implied with my arrows. The singlet and triplet states of the radical pair interconvert coherently. That is, they oscillate from singlet to triplet and back again with frequencies typically of a few million times per second. Okay, so quantum mechanics and birds are terms that don't often occur in the same sentence. Um, quantum mechanics and cats, however, occur all over the place on the internet, Schrodinger's cats. But what about birds? Well, this is a chaffinch. Some European chaffinches do migrate. This was known to the ancient Greeks. Their name for this bird is shown there, which translated is spinos. So maybe even the ancient Greeks knew about spins and possibly quantum birds. Okay, so how do we test this idea in the laboratory? So first of all, what do we know about the properties of the bird's compass? Well, we know that the sensors, whatever they are, are in the bird's eyes. Perhaps the obvious place for a process that requires light. More particularly, the sensors are in the thin layer of cells at the back of the eye known as the retina. This is the part of the eye that actually detects light and allows animals, humans as well, to see. The bird's retina is very complicated. There are six different types of photoreceptor cells involved in vision. And it looks like the magnetic sensors are in one of those photoreceptor cell types. So there's a molecule there, we think, which forms radical pairs when light is shone on it and allows the bird to detect the magnetic field direction. So when we started out on this a few years ago, we wanted a proof of principle that a radical pair reaction could be sensitive to a magnetic field as weak as that of the Earth. Because all those hundreds of laboratory studies I just mentioned typically would start at magnetic fields a hundred times stronger than the Earth mag Earth's magnetic field and then work up to even stronger fields. And we wanted to do the opposite, to go down to a magnetic field as weak as that of the Earth. And for this proof of principle experiment, we chose this somewhat unlikely looking molecule, which you can see a bit more clearly in this representation. So it's what's known as a triad. It has three parts, a carotenoid, a porphyrin, and a fullerene. So it's not supposed to be something that you would find in a bird's body or indeed anywhere else in biology. Carotenoids and porphyrins are widespread 
in biology, but not covalently linked here, and certainly not with a buckyball, a fullerene, tacked on the end. No, we chose this molecule because we thought it would have the right properties to be sensitive to very weak magnetic fields. And so it proved. So if you shine green light on this molecule, the porphyrin will absorb a green photon, and that causes an electron to leave the porphyrin and go on to the fullerene, producing a radical pair. That's swiftly followed by an electron jumping from the carotenoid to fill the hole in the porphyrin, so that well within a nanosecond, a billionth of a second, after the absorption of the green photon, we form this radical pair with one unpaired electron on the carotenoid and the other on the fullerene at opposite ends of the molecule. And by doing spectroscopic experiments on this molecule in the lab, we were able to show for the first time that a chemical reaction involving radical pairs can respond to a field as weak as that of the Earth's. And importantly, for a chemical compass, that that response depended on the direction of the field relative to some alignment axis of the molecules. And also that if you exactly inverted the direction of the field, nothing changed, like the bird's inclination compass. OK, but if that's not the molecule the birds use, what is it? Well, the breakthrough came in the 1990s when a protein called cryptochrome was discovered in this plant. So it's called the Rabidopsis. It's a model plant that is used for studies of plant genetics, otherwise called mouse ear cress. And by the end of the 1990s, it was clear that cryptochromes had the right kind of properties to produce radical pairs when they absorb light and that they're very widespread in nature. So birds have them in their eyes as well as in almost every cell in their bodies. Humans have cryptochromes. Most animals have cryptochromes. In plants, they regulate growth, amongst other things. In many organisms, they're involved in maintaining the circadian clock. And in birds, maybe, they're involved in magnetoreception. So this is a representation of the structure of a cryptochrome. It's a protein, which is a linear chain of, in this case, around 500 amino acids. And this is a representation of the structure of the backbone. So the amino acid side chains are not shown here. This is just the chain of 500 amino acids and the structure determined by X-ray diffraction. And it's complicated. The molecular mass of this molecule is around 60,000. So much, much bigger than that triad molecule we saw just now. And as you can see, it has loops and helices and sheets. It's a complicated structure required for its biological function, which in birds could be a number of things, certainly regulation of the 24-hour clock, but maybe also magnetic sensing. And if you look carefully into the middle, you can see a turquoise bit and some yellow bits here. And that's the business end of the molecule, we think, as far as magnetic sensing goes. So this is another representation, a part of that structure. So the gray stuff is the backbone of the protein. Uh, that's not so interesting. It's kind of a scaffolding for the bits shown here in color. So on the left-hand side, labeled FAD, there's a molecule in yellow and blue and red, and that's called flavin or flavin adenine dinucleotide. It's closely related to vitamin B2, riboflavin. It's a yellow compound. It absorbs blue light, roughly the wavelengths that the birds need for their magnetic compass to operate. And leading from the flavin in the middle of the molecule out to the surface is a chain of four 
tryptophan amino acids shown here in green. So the structures are down at the bottom on the left, the flavin on the right, the indole group of the tryptophan. And this behaves like a molecular wire. When the flavin absorbs a blue photon, you get four consecutive electron transfers. First, from the nearest tryptophan onto the flavin, and then from B onto A, C onto B, D onto C. Four consecutive electron transfers, so that within a nanosecond of absorption of the blue photon, you form a radical pair with one radical on the flavin and the other on the terminal tryptophan, here separated by around 20 angstroms, so two billionths of a meter away from the flavin. And it's this radical pair that we think may be doing the magnetic sensing. So how do we know that the electron transfer works in this way? Well, we can do experiments on the purified proteins using lasers, pulsed lasers. These experiments are called pump and probe. So you use a very short flash of blue laser light, less than a nanosecond to excite the flavin. You then wait a while and put in another flash of laser light with a different wavelength and usually lower intensity. And that second probe pulse measures the absorption spectrum of whatever is there at the time that it is applied. And from the absorption spectra, then varying the delay between the pump and the probe, we can map out the changes in the protein as the electrons jump along this chain. How do we know that the electron comes all the way from the end? Well, we can make mutant proteins. So we don't isolate this protein from birds. That would be extraordinarily difficult. We get bacteria to make it for us, E. coli. And by feeding the bacteria with different genetic information, you can get them to make variants on this cryptochrome protein, specifically variants in which each of the tryptophans, one at a time, has been replaced by a different amino acid, which doesn't do electron transfer. So we can block the electron transfer at different positions, A, B, C, or D, along this chain. And in that way, we know the electron comes all the way from the end. And this is cryptochrome 4A. Birds have six different cryptochromes, and we think this is the most likely one to be a magnetic sensor. So the basic idea is this. We start off with the protein shown in this cartoon. The blob is supposed to represent the shape of the protein itself, and it contains the flavin. And I've just shown one of the tryptophans here. Shine blue light on it. It forms a radical pair in a singlet state with anti-parallel electron spins shown by the arrows. This then interconverts with the triplet in a fashion that is dependent on the Earth's magnetic field and its direction. And then we get two competing processes. Either the singlet radical pair can come back to where it started, or the triplet radical pair can go on to form a different form of the protein, a protein that has a different shape. It's still the same protein. The tryptophan radical has picked up an electron so it's then back in its resting state, and the flavin has been stabilized by picking up a hydrogen ion. So this is a more stable, longer-lived form of the protein, which has a different shape, indicated by the blob there. And that different shape of the protein allows it to interact with other proteins, signaling partners, and that leads ultimately to the release of neurotransmitters from the cells that contain the proteins and eventually nerve impulses that go along the optical nerve to the brain, where that information is then integrated with other directional cues from sun, stars, olfaction, and so on. So that's the basic idea. We haven't proved yet that this is right, but it's looking promising. There's certainly no other hypothesis, no other molecule 
nearly as likely to do the job as cryptochrome 4a. So we've got a lot to do in the future to see whether this really is the right mechanism. So you might be wondering, what is it that the birds actually perceive when they detect the Earth's magnetic field while they're flying? Well, it's possible that they literally see the Earth's magnetic field. The sensors, as I've said, are in the retina. They use the retina for vision. Maybe they have some pattern superimposed on their field of vision that tells them the direction. We don't know how they perceive it. So this is biology. I get sometimes a little nervous talking about biology. I'm a physical chemist, uh, and so I sometimes feel a bit like this. So what we did a couple of years ago was to make a video of what a bird might perceive when it detects the Earth's magnetic field. So we took a drone out into the countryside, a couple of miles north of Oxford, close to where I live, and flew this drone in a circle above a cornfield. And then afterwards in the lab, superimposed on the video footage, the patterns that we had calculated using our knowledge of the magnetic properties of the radicals in cryptochrome 4a. So what you will see here when I start this video going is that the compass rose at top right will start to revolve. At the moment, the bird or the drone is looking due south. And as it looks around in a circle, you'll see in pink and blue patterns appearing, which tell the bird something about its heading direction. So here we go. The pattern changes as the bird looks round. Now it's west, coming round to northwest. And I'm going to try and stop this when it gets to north now. So about here. Now it's looking pretty much due north there. And the way we did this calculation, this rather distinctive cross pattern is coming into the center of the field of vision. So th this is science fiction. We don't know what the bird really perceives, but it is at least based on the properties of the flavin tryptophan radical pairs in cryptochrome. And so maybe then it's this kind of pattern that the birds use to detect the Earth's magnetic field and hence get a sense of direction. Okay, so I don't want to leave you with the impression that everything is about magnetism. So this is a homing pigeon and for the particular journey I'm going to show you on the map, it clearly was not using any kind of magnetism. So the bird was released a couple of miles north of the Oxford Ring Road, only two miles as the crow flies away from its loft. And this bird has obviously been that way before. It just followed the landmarks, the roads, up the A44, around the roundabout at Begbroke, unfortunately in the wrong direction, uh, up to the Woodstock roundabout, turn left onto the A4095, short detour here into the churchyard in Bladen, perhaps have a, have a look at Winston Churchill's grave, and then on to its loft, covering a distance of 6.7 miles. So for this bird at least, the magnetic compass, if it has one, uh, wasn't necessary. So what use is all of this? I mean, I hope you agree that it's a fascinating problem. It would be lovely to get to the bottom of this. Probably magnetic sensing is the least understood of all sensory mechanisms. We know a huge amount about vision and smell and hearing, sensors that we humans have. We don't seem to have a magnetic sense. It would be really wonderful to get to the bottom of this. But it would also be nice if there were some applications. Well, the displays on your mobile phones are almost certainly made out of organic molecules which act as light emitting diodes. Now, not the ones in your mobile phone, but similar organic LEDs are sensitive to weak magnetic fields. And the reason is basically the same as the cryptochromes. They don't form radical pairs. 
when you inject electrons and holes into them electronically, but they form what's known as polaron pairs or electron hole pairs. But these objects have the same physics, the Spain spin interactions as the radicals in cryptochrome. So if we could get to the bottom of what the birds are doing, we may be able to make better magnetic sensing devices for all kinds of applications using organic molecules that can be tailored by organic synthesis to have the right properties and which don't contain toxic, expensive, heavy metals that are biodegradable and disposable, cheap, flexible, green, eco-friendly. And the other kind of application is in conservation. So there are plenty of migratory bird species which are threatened these days by human activity like climate change and habitat destruction. If you try to relocate them to a better environment, typically they just fly back again. They're such good navigators. So if we could again understand how they sense the Earth's magnetic field, maybe we could fool them into staying put in the safer environment and so live there long enough to breed and multiply. So if you want to read a bit more about this, um, my collaborator Maritz and I wrote a Scientific American article. It was published in April last year. You can read a little bit more about what I've been telling you about there if you want. I just want to finish by thanking my collaborators, both in Oxford and in Oldenburg. Um, these are all professors in Oxford of chemistry and in Oldenburg of biology or physics or biochemistry. Um, many, many research students and postdoctoral fellows over the years, uh, whose names are too many to mention here, and these grant awarding bodies who have been generous with the funding. Uh, of course, it would not have been possible without all of them. So if you wonder what birds think about when they migrate, maybe it really is chemnav. Time will tell about that, or maybe they're thinking something else. And I'm sure none of you is in that condition. Thank you for listening.